So this podcast will be dealing with water activity. Uh, yesterday, I interviewed Evan van Tondo um, with his experiences on water activity. And um, I must say the discussion went on for far longer than what I anticipated. Um, I also just want to give you a heads up that um, the topic deals with quite a lot more than water activity. Uh, we delve into talking about salt and nitrates and nitrites and some history on the curing of meat. Um, and it all relates back to water activity. So please watch the whole video. It's nearly an hour long and I'm pretty sure of it that you would, will learn quite a lot from it, just like I did. Um, so please, uh, yeah, just, just go through the whole thing. It, it is very interesting. Today I'm uh, sitting here with Eben van Tonde, um, and one of the most important things that we can understand and know about curing meat is water activity. It's something that we don't often talk about, and I'm going to be talking to Eben about that. He's done quite extensive research. Um, he's also got a, a part on his uh, website called earthwomexpress.com. Um, there's, there's quite a bit of information on that. So Eben... Um, just, just quickly, just a little bit about yourself and your background, and then, uh, and then we'll jump into the topic. You know, I've been uh, involved in, in, in meat the last 15, 20 years uh, in South Africa uh, f with uh, f a, a couple of other guys. We uh, created a brand here in the Western Cape, uh, Woody's Consumer Brands, uh, which at some point was one of the big uh, producers in South Africa. And um, I'm not involved in that business anymore, but I'm still in the meat business and uh, uh, involved in new product development and, uh, uh, you know, the type of things we talk about here. So it's, uh, it's great to be part of your project. Fantastic. Jan, it's great to have you part as well, uh, Evan. Thank you very much for, 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 for taking the time and coming on. All right, so I think let's jump into the topic, water activity. Just what is, what is water activity? Well, what, water activity is actually, a, uh, I'm going to give you the exact definition here, it's, it's got to do with uh, 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 the difference, uh, the ratio uh, between the vapor pressure in the food itself and uh, basically the, the air around the food, uh, the vapor pressure around the food. But in, in practical terms, an easy way for me to, <laughs> to know what it is all about, it's about the amount of uh, 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 free water that is available in the, uh, in the meat or in any food uh, product. Uh, even bread, any, any bread, any, you know, food contains water. Um, and um, it is to manage that water. Water activity is important because uh, without water, bacteria can't operate. And so uh, water activity is directly related to, uh, uh, um, let's call it the, the, ability, the, the, the propensity of food to spoil or not spoil, whether it's good food or not or good food. Uh, that relates back to bacteria because it's the, the activity of the bacteria in the food that spoil the food and make it dangerous. They, there's uh, certain toxins associated with certain bacteria, and that is the toxins that uh, give us diarrhea and uh, bring about listeriosis, which has uh, uh, been in the news a lot and is one of the big ones to combat in the, in the meat industry and in the food industry in general. Um, so the, the, the uh, lower the water activity, <clears throat> the more stable the food will be, uh, uh, the, the longer it will keep. It, it won't spoil even outside the refrigerator. So that's yeah. So that's very interesting because obviously you know, me started off as being a curer at home and then went more commercial and now being back as a home curer. Um, we 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 don't always at the forefront of the science um, like you would be in, in your organisation, and so so I was I was effectively taught that what we're trying to do um, without really understanding and I mean, obviously over time I've read up about it, but but obviously. One of the things, or the main, the main things of, of curing is to try and remove the water from within the animal or, or the cut of meat that we're wanting to cure, and that we achieve uh, obviously through the use of salt. Um, and and I, again, I always make the analogy to people um, that that if you're about to barbecue a steak, or your wife is cooking something, or you cooking something in the kitchen, one of the first things you do is you salt the meat. And you leave the, the meat for half an hour and you come back later and there's a little pool of blood. And that's actually not the blood. It's just that it's colored because of obviously there, there is a little bit of blood still left. But that's the water that's been extracted out of, out of the meat. And, and is that basically what you're referring to in terms of, of trying to reduce the water activity? So, so if the, the, the water activity ratios, just to it's a, a, a couple of uh, uh, interesting ratios. So, so for example, cheese spread will have a water activity of 0.95. Uh, 
uh, uh, red bean paste will have 0.93, uh, caviar is 0.92, uh, um, fat sauce is 0.83, uh, salami is 0.82. Uh, uh, botulinum, for example, which we spoke about, the minimum water activity required for botulinum to, to, to become a problem is 0.93. So uh, the higher that percentage is, the, 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 the bigger the propensity. There are certain bacteria that can only function at a certain level of water activity. So there's, uh, I think I've got on, that on my website also those tables, uh, f uh, and we can, we can maybe put that up there as well. Uh, uh, but it, it, if it's the, the higher that percentage of the water activity, the bigger the, the, the propensity to spoil. Now, just to come back to your uh, uh, very good uh, example you give, if you salt the meat, and there's a little bit of, of uh, red water. Um, there's a couple of uh, interesting, uh, important things that comes up there. And that is, yes, the, the, the salt, if you salt the meat, so, so uh, we know that salt, it will reduce the water activity. The, uh, within the meat itself, there's a couple of interesting things happening there because the salt is one of the oldest ways that we have to get the water out of the meat. And it is the most basic way of, of uh, preserving meat. Uh, if you uh, uh, rub the salt onto the surface of the meat, now the meat wants to restore equilibrium between uh, the salt level on the outside and the salt level on the inside. And so the water is going to migrate towards the salt part and the salt is going to migrate into the meat. Um, and that is basically how the salting takes place. Uh, but, but in essence, the uh, salt itself has a multiple, uh, there's, there's a multitude of, of uh, uh, good reasons why you want to use salt in meat and in processing. Uh, in processing, uh, it's got to do with protein uh, protein extraction, uh, which in turn has got to do with uh, stability of emulsions and those kind of things. But in simple terms for the, the, the home curer, you want to get the, the water activity lower. So if you, for example, now make ham, if you do a dry cure product, um, if you just, it's, it's actually very simple. If you take the, it is a, it's a race against time to get the water activity as low as possible so that the bacteria can stop their activity. Bacteria needs the water so that they can get the nutrients which they after through the membrane membrane that that can migrate into the uh, uh, cell into the bacteria uh, and that they can that, that they can live from that and, and and by the same time that they can excrete, excrete whatever they need to excrete as part of their metabolism uh, 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 that the, the, the mechanism is going to be water. So if there's no water in the meat the, the, uh, you take away the ability for the bacteria to do their job. Now, that does not mean that you kill the bacteria. The, uh, uh, ba the, these bacteria, different bacteria are, are, are uh, uh, salt tolerant to, to, to different levels. So you won't necessarily kill the bacteria. You may just stop the bacteria from doing its work, which is also another very important thing to remember, because if you're going to add water again at the end, you, you, you reignite that ability for the bacteria to do, to, 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 to do its work, basically to live. And it is in the process of living that the bacteria then, as a byproduct of their uh, 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 metabolism, that they excrete then, for example, certain toxins and those kind of things, which is what causes us to get ill. So, so lactic acid bacteria, for example, they will take nutrients from the environment and they will excrete lactic acid. And that's the thing that you taste in the meat that is sour. It is that activity of the, of the bacteria. And lactic acids, lactics, they call them, uh, 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 lactics are by themselves not necessarily bad bacteria. It's actually good bacteria for us. And in a sense, this is an interesting thing, is that, that you can use lactics. Uh, we, we mentioned botulism now, uh, uh, botulinum that needs, what did we say, 0.93. Uh, uh, it needs at least 0.93 to operate. Below that, botulism won't be a problem. So, so, so botulism, for example, uh, 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 you will first taste, the, 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 the meat will first taste sour before botulism is going to become a problem. So, so even though it's something that irritates us about meat, if we buy bacon and it's sour and say, oh, we wasted our money. But in a sense, that's an important safeguard because some of the more harmful bacteria, you will not necessarily taste that immediately. In fact, bot botulinum, you know, you're not going to taste the toxin at all. You're just going to get very sick. Uh, uh, so so by, by tasting the sourness and then spitting it out and say, all right, this is sour, I'm not going to eat it. That is one of the ways that we safeguard you from the, from the more serious uh, 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 bacteria. So one of the things that, 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 that we don't completely want to get rid of in our meat, for example, is lactics. It, it, they, they fulfill an important function as an early warning system, if you want to call that, for possible more dangerous bacteria that can be present in the meat. 
Okay, that aside, so now you, you uh, there's a race against time. Now you want to cure the meat. So so and and as part of the curing is you, you 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 we spoke a little bit about it. Now you want nitric oxide formation that is going to change the color of the meat. It's going to give it a nice uh, 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 reddish color. It's going to give you a, a, a very distinct cure. A, a, a taste to the meat. The ham is going to be beautiful. It's going to taste fantastic. But before before that can happen, before uh, 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 that uh, uh, chemical reaction can happen in the meat, and by the way, in terms of uh, palmer hams and long cured dried products, that happens uh, as a as a consequence of what is inherently part of the meat. There's nothing. If you only cure with salt, there's nothing that you add. That, that that induces nitric oxide formation, for example. It is it is the natural breakdown of uh, the structure of the meat uh, that causes that releases a, a, a certain chemical components that 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 creates the nitric oxide that cures the meat. But now, if you just hang the the, the piece of meat on the tree or, or or in your garage or whatever the case is in your kitchen, it's going to spoil. The bacteria is going to destroy the meat completely before you had to, uh, for, before curing could take place. Uh, uh, so what you do is you remove the water, and but but it's also very important because we don't want to remove the water completely because you 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 made a very good uh, example there of if you barbecue and you have a piece of steak if you overcook the steak it's going to be dry. So by the same token, water is related to the juiciness of the meat that we eat that the whole taste experience. So. It's a fine balance. You don't want to get rid of all the water, right? And so, if you do a ham, it's a, 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 this in 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 getting the water out. There's two ways that we can get the water out. The, the mechanism that we use to do that in the dry curing environment is we use salt and we use the the, the difference between the uh, uh, the humidity of the air outside and let's say it's it's very dry the air outside and it's very humid inside the meat. The again. Uh, nature abhors a vacuum. It wants to create equi equilibrium, and the water is going to migrate out of the meat. But now it's a it's it, it's a fine art because if you dry it too quickly, right, then a crust forms, a dry crust forms on the outside, and and you need a little bit of water. Remember from school science, the capillary action of a, 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 a water running down these 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 capillaries. Right and 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 the the, the 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 energy that pulls the water up and out at the end of the day. So so there needs to be water in the system. It's, if it's just completely dry and you create the crust around your ham, it's not going to be able to get out. And then you have rotting on the inside of the ham. Right. So they've worked it out. The Italians and the Germans and you know around the world they've taught us how to do it. It's a, it's a fine balance that you can't do it too quickly. You want to slowly take the water out. So the basis is to remove the water. Uh, and you remove the ability for bacteria to to do their job. They, no, not their job. What bacteria does, uh, for, you know, uh, for, uh, eating and living. You know, and it's the eating and living of bacteria that makes us sick. So it all goes back to the management of bacteria. There is also one little uh, uh, caveat that we must also add in here, and that is that 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 uh, uh, enzymes in the meat that breaks meat down. Uh, it's also related to the moisture in the meat. And, and for certain dry cure hams, one of the reasons why dry cure hams are so beautiful and so tasty is because we soften the meat by the activity, the, 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 uh, uh, the different processes in the meat where it breaks down even apart from bacteria, right? So, so water activity is also related to the speed with what that happens and uh, 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 meat processing in, in general, if, you know, if we can just put it like that. In general, what, is the, what was the first object of meat processing. The, 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 we can say that the first object of meat processing when humans started emerging as, as, as cognitive, uh, conscious human beings with an intellect that we have, that uh, f uh, the reason why we started processing meat and not just eat the raw meat, which is the natural very first thing that we did, we ate the raw meat. The problem is meat is tough. So you want to soften meat, right? And so we relate softness of meat directly to quality of meat. So this is why we, we don't completely want to stop that process of, of, uh, of uh, um, uh, the breaking down of the meat. Let's keep it in simple terms. Uh, uh, that needs to continue, and for that you need water. So you also don't want to take all the water out. So that's a long answer to a short question. All right. So, so you mentioned uh, with your water activity the, the figures for Clostridium botulinum. botulinum. 
um, that the um, water activity rate for that is 0.93. Now, I just want to, I just want to um, emphasize that is not percentage. That is actually a very scientific formula that actually works out the water activity within the, the, the meat and then the various uh, levels or the various points at which the, the various bacterias will stop um, being active. As Eben pointed out, the, they don't necessarily die, but they become inactive. So those are the various points. My second point is... Based on what you've just explained about the curing of a Palmer ham and the process that, that it takes, and that's, you know, a lot of people are trying to understand why, and it's one of the things that I battled with when I first started, is that we actually are adding humidity, um, or, or we need a, quite a high humidity when we're curing meats, because, um, and, and that, that seems counterintuitive, and I'm going to relate this back to another scenario, is that I come from South Africa, same as Eben, and one of, something that's, that's almost bigger than religion in South Africa, almost, is biltong. Uh, biltong, uh, I mean, everybody in their, their auntie has got their own recipe, and they won't share it, and it's, it's, a, it's a big competition as to who produces the best biltong. But biltong is a scenario where you actually dehydrate the meat as quickly as you can. So that, that was my starting re or my reference point. Then you get to uh, some of these balata hams that cure for up to seven years. And that just really sort of got my mind. And then I started understanding that, that obviously the, the initial cure is, is almost a shock where you're using salt to extract a lot of that moisture. And then that ham gets hung in a, in a fairly humid environment, but, but not, uh, you know, you don't want too much humidity above 80% uh, because then you start getting mold issues, which we'll have also discuss in a different topic. But, but that, that process then is to then extract the balance of the moisture, but over an extrapolated time. So we're wanting to do that as slowly as possible. And that then also, as, as, as Evan pointed out, breaks down the enzymes within the meat and makes that meat uh, I, I, well, well it, it, it develops the flavor of the meat, the color of the meat, and so forth. Then just the other point that I, I wanted to, to highlight, which we will be discussing um, in, a, in a future topic on nitrates and nitrites. I mean, one thing that Eben mentioned about the curing of the hams was that when we're curing whole muscles, we're not necessarily adding nitrates because there still is a process, a chemical reaction that takes place within the meat over the prolonged period. So that's just important to understand why um, some people won't add nitrates to the, to the meat that, that converts to a nitrite. Um, that's not required in whole muscle curing in terms of a preservative or a preventative against botulism. What people actually are doing with, with adding the, the nitrite to a whole cured um, a muscle is is adding color that's essentially what happens but we're gonna we're gonna delve into that and actually actually why that's very important in a different topic down the line so so that that's very important and again just to just to re-emphasize we add salt at the beginning of the curing process to extrapolate as much of the water as possible and we get that to a point then we put it into a, 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 a place where we we then extrapolate the the additional or, or as much of the additional moisture as possible Remembering that we always leave some moisture because otherwise it's literally going to be a dried up, uh, a very unpleasant thing to eat. So, so that's important. So uh, the, other, the, the one thing that Eben mentioned about um, us as humans, um, obviously going back in time, we did. We, we, eat, we used to eat meat raw. Um, and I, I guess it boils down to the, the, the advent of fire or the invention of fire or the discovery of fire where we then started cooking meat. And that's why we also don't have, have sharp teeth because, I mean, obviously mammals in generally have quite quite sharp pointy teeth and that's to break it down. Us humans, we're, we're the only mammal that has straight edged te teeth. So um, fr from a cooking process uh, or cooking the meat has, has caused us to not require sharp teeth or pointy teeth, and, and, and it's just an interesting fact. So now we understand why we cook meat and why, why we are made up the way we are. I want to add just one interesting thing what you, what you mentioned there, and that is that in terms of, in terms of bolting, for example, and jerky, uh, the, now I've, as, a, as, a matter of, as a matter of interest, I've, I, I keep on researching this uh, phenomena around the world. 
And what seems to have been the technology uh, uh, that, that spread around the globe, uh, how that spread around the globe is another question, right? But let's st stick to the fact that they, the, the fact that you dry meat to preserve meat, right? Because that was fundamental to our, for, to, into our, for our ability to travel long distances and to explore and to hunt and to do all these kinds of things. Is can do we have food? Are we going to have food there? And can we carry that food with us? So initially, how it worked is that is that they would dry the you would hang the meat and exactly what you said the the drying of meat eating of meat was all about the management the the the, the culinary, culinary arts developed uh, from our need to soften meat right so what they did is they would hang the, the the meat and and then what they would do is before they eat the meat they would pulverize that meat with a stone into a, a, a fine a, a, um, a dust type of uh, uh, consistency and then they will add that back to the water and they will actually rehydrate the meat so uh, I spent some time in Nepal, and they and that's exactly that technology is exactly what they did in Nepal, and and that is exactly what they did in in, in southern Africa. The the uh, the the, the uh, old people who can still remember who's got the oral tradition in the tribes. I, I I as a habit when I go into an area, I go and find the oldest ladies, and I sit down with them and uh, and uh, uh, a translator, and I ask them how did they prepare their meat. And they explained to me, and invariably those dishes, whilst they would hang it out, then they would collect that uh, a very dry pieces of meat, which is now tough to eat. And it sounds as if that is against the argument. Why did they preserve it like that? Well, they would pulverize it and add it back into water, into a stew, and then they will uh, rehydrate the meat. And that was done in Nepal exactly without any spices added at that point in time. Uh, uh, and there's stories in, in uh, 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 you know, in South Africa. The researchers, uh, when I started looking into this issue, would tell me that salt, for example, was not used in Southern Africa. Uh, it was it's a salt scarce area, which which uh, is actually not true. It was a salt rich area, but uh, uh, most of the tribes didn't use salt. Well, they did use salt, and uh, uh, they, they actually used a lot of salt. In that, uh, uh, how they did is they, they 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 before they hang the meat, they would roll the meat in the ash. So they will make a fire, create ash, and then they roll the meat in the ash. Well, there's the salt. It's, it's, it's from the ash. Then they will hang the meat because the, as one old gentleman, I asked him, why do you do, why do, you do it? And he was very uh, uh, surprised at my question. And he said to me, now, how else are you going to keep the flies from the meat if you don't roll it in ash? So it, he had the two uh, dual function. I think they initially did it to protect it from the flies. But then, uh, uh, obviously, they also got the salt with that. So, so uh, uh, the salt is very important. Uh, they, uh, they actually cured meat in Southern Africa. They, uh, I was told that there's no tradition of meat curing in Africa. Com completely wrong. There's a very rich history of, of uh, meat curing in, in Africa. That, and the, what, the minerals that was added and, and how they did it just doesn't look the same way as it happened in Europe. Uh, right. so, so, so that is the one interesting thing. And, and, and uh, uh, I spoke to some people very high up in the Himalaya mountains, uh, 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 and they told me exactly the same thing. The exact same technology was used, the exact same methods. Um, and then to your, uh, uh, you made an interesting comment about fire, the, the invention of fire. So one would think that the, the, that the best way of getting rid of bacteria is to cook it. So, uh, uh, well, yes, it is one of the techniques that we can use. but. Uh, uh, in the, the history of humans, if we go back to the earliest human, uh, we know, for example, that fire was discovered and undiscovered, lost, if you will. Uh, uh, you can't undiscover something, but the, the, the technology was lost. So, so in one cave, for example, there will be time periods when fire was used in the cave, and then very long time periods where the, where the cave was still inhabited, but there's no evidence of fire during that time period, which indicates that... that that the technology fell into disuse, and and there's there, there's evidence that it was not primarily used to cook meat. Cooking of meat became actually uh, uh, it, it, uh, together with salt in in the south of of, of Italy and Sicily in those places. There's beautiful, very old, a century old established salt uh, operations there. So 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 the development of of food into a culinary art. Is, uh, is is uh, almost a Roman invention, if you, if you want to call it that. And and uh, and those, uh, you know, it was very rudimentary at that point in time. So sure, we had our preferences in, in terms of, of 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 meat. But now, the 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 uh, uh, what is off meat and not off meat is is something to a large extent that is taught. 
it is it, it's a uh, the gag response for example as humans it's a thought uh, 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 response that develops uh, very early in, in in childhood it's not something that's instinctive so 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 to have a repulsion to sour meat for example is something that we were taught so, so the, the the evidence is that the oldest people would simply use what we would call the rotting as a way to 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 soften the meat they will take the carcasses and they will throw the carcasses in water and they will leave the carcasses in water for extended periods of time to rot as much as possible under the the water to give it get it as soft as possible throw into the mix the the the, the existence of maggots and worms and those kind of things they saw the worms and the maggots and whatever as a delicacy. And uh, uh, there's, there's, there's stories of, of uh, uh, hunters in, in the Nordic countries, uh, uh, who, you know, very primitive hunters who were evacuated from an area because of uh, a disease or whatever the case may be. And, and when they got to the boat who was there to rescue them, they will be carrying a seal carcass with worms crawling out of the seal carcass. And, and if the captain then uh, of the ship acts in revulsion against that, they will say that is the tastiest meat. That is the prized meat. That is the meat that the chiefs will only eat. Uh, 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 you know, so, so you refer to the, the activity of the enzymes. Of, uh, uh, enzyme activity, which is also related to water and related to temperature, uh, uh, you know, you, you want the enzyme activity to slowly start breaking down the meat. So in a sense, we still use the rotting technology. We just manage the way the less desirable uh, uh, components for our modern society. Old society would have looked at that and said, uh, uh, you know, that's perfect. Just a last story. A quick, quick one. There's a, the, uh, about this, this rotting of meat. There's a, there's a story that uh, uh, one of these frontier travelers tells also in one of the Nordic countries, um, I think if my memory serves correct, where he was staying at an inn and uh, he ordered meat and the guy brought him meat and the meat was rotten. And um, he then said, no, you can't eat this meat. And he pushed it back. And the guy brought him meat uh, even more rotten. He couldn't speak the language. And he pushed it back again and said he can't eat it. And the third time when he did that, the guy said to him, come with me. Every time the meat was more rotten. And, and uh, he walked outside him to the lake. And the guy pulled another rope with, with a carcass at the end of the rope. And he said, uh, well, in effect, what he, the guy understood him to say, this is now the most rotten meat that we have. We don't have more rotten meat. You have meat rotten to a greater degree. We, we don't, because he thought the guy's pushing it back, saying it's not rotten enough. It's not rotten enough. It's, not, it's, it's still too hard. It's still too hard. And he's saying, I can't rot it even more. This isn't meat that's old enough uh, to your liking. You know? And he was actually just saying the opposite. So it's interesting how our, our, our complete perception of this completely flipped. Um, I also just very quickly talking about bacteria, uh, uh, which is related to water activity. There's a, the, uh, you know, there's, there's a general truth, and that is that, that um, your healthier bacteria, lactic acid bacteria, for example, is a more robust type of bacteria than, than, than your uh, 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 you know, Clostridium, for example, and 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 bacteria that that uh, 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 that will make you sick, pathogens. You know, pathogenic bacteria that will, that will cause us to get sick and maybe even die. So, so, so in just in terms of cleaning, you know, there's a saying in 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 the industry that we say it's better not to clean than to clean only half, than to do a poor job at cleaning. If you're going to do a poor job at cleaning, rather don't clean at all. And, and, and at least keep the, the, the healthy, in inverted comma, bacteria, give them a, a, a space uh, because they will drive out the, the, the more severe uh, pathogens. At least you're not going to die from it. You're not going to like the food, but you're not going to die from it. So that not to say that we shouldn't clean, that to say that we must clean well. Uh, practice very thorough hygiene. You know, uh, there's no half measures with these things. Uh, that's just as a little note uh, to relate to bacteria. So in other words, what you're saying is either do it very well or don't do it at all. That's exactly. Don't try that's and do exactly. a half job. Yeah. No, I no, mean, that's, that's an interesting point job. because same thing with the curing chamber. I mean, you know, again, you know, um, I mean, the, the curing of Kulatelo, and I'll, I'll very often, you'll, you'll find that I very often go back to Kulatelo because it's a passion of mine. And I, I find the, 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 the curing of it very fascinating. And I, sorry, this has got nothing to do with water activity, but just a little anecdote. Again, in that um, in Italy, they, they, they only cure Culatello. Well, Culatello is basically made in eight little villages not far from um, Parma, from the city Parma. And very, very specific conditions. And there's a very specific mold 
which is fairly similar to noble rot, which we get, which we make sweet wines from, um, the, you know, the straw wines. And um, they've got a philosophy, where, and, 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 and part of the part of the problem that 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 why Culatello nearly died out as a as a as a, a delicacy is when when hygiene became a the norm. Um, the, the 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 government started regulating, and and because of because it's called noble rot, the, the this mold it, it literally produces a, a, a process on this meat which gives it its unique taste, and they they were oh this this can't happen and and the, anyway they some of the, the locals in in this region marched on parliament and they eventually got it passed and it's now a, a, a heritage if I can call it that a heritage meat but they literally do not clean the um, areas where they cure these meats it's, it's left completely dusty uh, they leave it as it is because that produces the mold anyway but that's got nothing to do with water activity just something interesting and we'll probably touch on that um, just a couple of points what highlighted for me when you mentioned about the curing of, of well not the curing of meat but how the ancients used to do it and there are two things that I'd, I'd like to just highlight here we know um, a, a, a salted cod which is basically fish that has been salted and then sun dried. Now, I mean, most of us won't be able to get our head around that because the, the first thing you do with fish is put it in the fridge. You don't leave it out in the sun to dry. And, and that goes back to that whole thing of what you mentioned about dehydrating the meat. So the salted cod gets put in the sun and to dry, and that takes days to do. And once it's dried, it's almost this hard piece of meat um, and then, and then they would cook with it, basically rehydrating it and introducing it into stews or, to, or in, into the products that they would cook. So that's that's why salted cod is made. Um, and then just an interesting, another interesting anecdote on on the number one, as you say, natural salt. How did the hard? You know, you mentioned in in Africa where they rolled, or, or basically in in indigenous tribes around the world. They used to roll the meat in, in, in ash. Well, as you may or may not know, I am a South African, but I, I now live in Poland. And one of the things that is, a, is an exceptional delicacy here is something called steak tartare, which is known around the world as basically raw mince with a raw egg and a little bit of dressing. Now, how that came about is the, the Tartars who basically came from from the east and they were invading all of the east and then came across into Europe. So what they would do is, as they, they had a philosophy that they would leave nothing. So they would basically kill everything, people, animals. The only thing they saved were the horses. They were the horse people. So the only animals that they would save were, were basically horses. Everything else got, got killed. But they then killed, obviously, all the all the cattle and all the domestic animals and what did they do with it they would put the meat underneath their saddles on their horses and as they would ride that would soften the meat and the sweat from the horses would salt i mean sweat has got salt in it so that would salt the meat and that would tenderize the meat and after days of riding like that they would then have this very tender meat that they would then chop up and eat and that's where steak tartar comes from so very interesting. I, I, when you mentioned that, that, that immediately sparked, uh, uh, and again, obviously also dehydrating the meat as it goes along, and and the, you know, so so interesting, interesting stories. Gil, absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned that because there's a it's an interesting uh, uh, backstory to that. Is that uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, my grandparents had a farm in the Northern Free State, and uh, as kids we were more on the farm than at home, and um, uh, I, the first time when I learned about Salpeter, it was the sweat of the horses. So, so what you're saying, and, and when I started in meat curing, they talk about Salpeter, which is, uh, of course, uh, uh, nitrates, uh, uh, NO3, spelled with an A. Um, and uh, 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 that is called Salpeter. And Salpeter, uh, uh, and when uh, my parents or uh, my grandparents always referred to the white sweat on the horses as Salpeter, if we uh, rode them without saddles, uh, the, the, you know, we would. Uh, Always have you know it will be uh, you you know when you have to go home when you when your legs burn so much from the salt from the saltpeter that you have to go home now and go and take a bath and um, 
uh, I wonder, how do they take the sweat of the horses? Is that what we do when they say we use salpeter to, to cure the meat? I said, so where do they get the sweat of the horses from? But that's exactly where that term comes from. So, so they would, uh, it had the same effect as the salpeter. Now, the interesting thing is that, uh, that our sweat, our uh, human sweat, the same with horse sweat, the horse sweat contains NO3, right, nitrates. It, it's not just the normal salt. Uh, uh, not just the sodium chloride, it's the, it's, it's the NO, NO3 that comes out as well. And then what happens is the bacteria that, that lives on the skin of the horse, uh, that then those are reducing bacteria. So, so, they, so, so, so one of the oxygen, one of the, so, 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 so it's nitrogen and then two oxygen atoms, one of the oxygen at atoms are not so tightly bound and they split, they, they take them, uh, they use that in the metabolism and the, uh, uh, so, so the, uh, very quickly, within, uh, within minutes, the nitrate changes into nitrite, and the nitrite then penetrates the meat in the normal process of, of, of ingressing into the meat, and that then cures the meat. So, so the curing that, 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 that the Tartars did, and which, which our, you and my, our forefathers did, is exactly the same curing as we do today. And, and then there's a, there's, a, there's a great story that I came when I was researching this years ago. From the from the First World War, where one of the generals would, um, when the uh, uh, when the army marched off, he would uh, uh, dish out a couple of days of, of meat rations to the to the troops because the question was how do you preserve it, and they would stuff that meat into their underwear, right? And they would march with the meat in their underwear, and it will have exactly the same effect. What you're talking about, it's the normal so the, the normal salt. It comes out of the body, uh, the, the, the sodium and the chloride, and then the, the, the nitrates, the salpeter, comes out of our skin as well. And, 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 and it's one of the protecting mechanisms uh, that our bodies have. The, uh, the, uh, I wanted to make this, this comment earlier as well, and that is that when you talk about natural, uh, not natural, this, you know, all curing is natural, but if you talk about long-term curing, the months and years of curing uh, uh, meat, uh, remember, where does the uh, uh, nitrogen, when, when they discovered uh, 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 the molecule or, or, or that, that, that we call a, a protein, when protein was discovered, we realized that, that part of the protein is nitrogen. And nitrogen is so important that that became the way that we count the, the proteins. So there's a direct relationship between the, uh, all we need to do is we, may, we, we, we take the meat, if we want to see how much protein is in a sausage, we take, the, the, take it, we burn it, we analyze for nitrogen, we, we, we count, we weigh the nitrogen, and then by, by uh, uh, extrapolating, uh, we, we can, by calculation, then calculate, based on the amount of nitrogen that we have, how much protein was in the meat, right? So, so it is that natural breakdown of the, 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 the meat through, through, through enzymes and also through, through, through bacteria that, 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 that causes the release of the nitrogen. So, for example, uh, uh, ammonia, for example, you know, uh, the, 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 the smell that puts us off a rotting carcass, right? Part of ammonia is nitrogen, right? So that's another source of, of, of nitrogen. So curing in, in, in the old days, uh, 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 salpeter or, or, nit or, or nitrates or nitrites, that is not the only salt that you can use to cure. Another salt is, uh, uh, was called sal ammonia. Uh, uh, which is ammonium chloride, and I've done curing of meat with ammonium chloride, and it, it's got the, uh, you know there is no problem with that. It cures as well as uh, uh, nitrates will cure meat. Uh, I've done it here in Cape Town, and uh, uh, so, so so that's so to to say that the, that there's a problem with with uh, we spoke about this earlier at length, but to say that there's a problem with curing of meat with 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 nitrates. Well, that's a little bit of, of, of double talk because in all flesh, in all humans, in, 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 in nitrogen is part of life as much as carbon is part of life. It is as essential to, to, for us to exist as human beings. Uh, you, you cannot say that, 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 that nitrogen is a problem. It's, it's essential to life in certain, uh, in, in excess concentrations. Yes, that's a problem. Okay, but back to the issue of water activity. That's just a little uh, afterthought. There's three things that I think is also important just uh, uh, still to mention, not to f when we talk about water, uh, uh, to water activity, and that is that that when we say that water is a problem in meat, we must remember that we, we we it is free water that is the problem. It is unbound water, 
right? So one of the things when 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 we make bacon, so because how do we, we 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 one of the things about bacon is people have a problem if you add any water to the bacon because they say oh that is just the producer to make it cheaper or whatever and that's a problem. No, it's it's not as simple as that because if you don't do that, you can have a very dry piece of meat and dry meat is is not always appetizing, right? So you want a nice juicy piece of bacon as well, right? And uh, the difference is that we bind the water. So, so if we can bind the water, the better we bind the water, the more we remove the water, so to say, from the pool, available pool for, for uh, bacteria now to use as their, uh, 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 um, let's call it medium, in which they can do their thing. Right, if you can put it in very simple terms. So one of one of the ways that we that that that, that we can that we bind the water is by manipulating the protein structure. So the protein they 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 they, they talk about the globular uh, 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 form. Right, one of the things that we want to do is we want to want the, that globular form of the protein to open up because there's what they call hydrophilic parts to the to it and hydrophobic parts part that that that, that love water and parts that don't like water right so the parts that, that 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 like the water or that will bind to the water putting it in very simple terms that's on the inside of the protein we want to open the protein up that they are on the outside so that they can bind to the water right so uh, uh, one of the one of the reasons in in, in industrial uh, uh, bacon production and even at home uh, if you need meat or, 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 or if you uh, 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 pound meat and, uh, and you soften meat, one of the things that you also do is you, you manipulate the protein structure and you're opening up mechanically that, 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 that protein. So, so there's, there's two ways, that you, there's three ways that you can open that protein up. The one way is through mechanical means uh, and, and in big processing facilities, that is why we tumble the meat in tumblers. Right, and and another way that you can do it is chemically. If you increase the acidity, uh, it will open up the protein as well. That's why it goes white. Right, and another way that you can do it is through heat. So you, virtually immediately, the protein starts denaturing. They call it, uh, and uh, 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 the higher the temperature goes, the more the protein structure opens up, and the more effectively it binds the meat, the the, the water. So that's also uh, 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 so. So we're talking about unbound water, not bound water. So the more you bind the water, right, the lower the, uh, the you also reduce the water activity, right? Uh, another uh, inter another important concept here is the is, is we talk about salting, the effect of salting on, on bacteria, right? So we said that salt does not always, uh, uh, salt will not kill the bacteria, right? It needs to be in, uh, in extreme high percentages for it to kill the bacteria, for example, or, 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 or to, yeah, to, 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 to disable the bacteria, if you want to call it that. So the bacteria in the sea, for example, the sea is salt, and yet there's plenty of bacteria in the sea. So, 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 so salt-tolerant bacteria is all around us. So it's, 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 uh, to, to think that salt is a preservative by itself is wrong. Salt preserves by removing moisture. That is the mechanism. That's it, right? So, so but there is an important thing here, and that is that, 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 that salt creates what they call an uh, uh, osmotic shock to the bacteria. So th th there's a concept of a lag phase in the activity of bacteria, which is very important to remember. So uh, uh, it's the, and, and the, the easiest way to explain this is when you jump into a cold swimming pool. The, the, the experience that you have, if you jump, in, jump into freezing water, our immediate response is, oh, we shiver up and we, 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 we clamp up and we shiver. And then we get used to the, to the water and we relax and we start enjoying it. And we shout at the people who are still, still outside the swimming pool now. It's not that cold. It's not that cold. Just jump in. It will be over very quickly, right? Bacteria have the exact same experience than us, right? So whenever you change the environment of the bacteria, there's a lag, right? Uh, this lag phase and how long that lag phase lasts depends on what you do and how severe it is and how quickly can the bacteria uh, regroup and readjust to its new environment, right? So if you, and, and, and I've used this very effectively in processing in the past because by understanding that, you know that there is a certain period of time. If I do something to the bacteria, if I either change the temperature or uh, reducing the temperature, making it very cool, Right? Or I, I, I change the water, the percentage of water. I take some of the water out of the meat, right? Or the food, whatever the food is, right? Or I change the pH or whatever. It does not necessarily mean that I completely eliminate the bacteria, 
but there will be a period of time where there will, where there will be severely retarded bacterial, bacterial activity. The bacteria wants to multiply, as all humans also want to multiply. We want to multiply and fill the earth. The same thing with the bacteria. They also want to multiply and fill the earth. But And that is why you find that on a curve, the, the bacterial aspect, bacteria will, they won't start growing immediately in a straight line curve. Of, uh, they will sl first slowly multiply, 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 and then it will become exponential and everything will, will uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it will be, become a disaster very quickly, uh, you know, because it's exponential. So, 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 so the bacteria, by salting it, we, we also change the environment and, and, and it gives us, it gives us an opportunity to do other things, you know. So in a, in a more industrial type of uh, uh, meat curing operation, it gives us the, 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 the opportunity if we reduce the temperature and we cool the meat down, right? Uh, 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 the same thing, uh, bacteria is the same as humans. We don't want to do a lot of things when it's cold. It's not going to kill us, but we don't want to do a lot of things, right? So, so, you, so, so it's important to work with the, the meat while it's cold. Right, uh, uh, it's important to use the salt, and and uh, uh, salt is important for 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 microcontrol. Of course, when we're going to barbecue and we and 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 uh, 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 you know we take the meat out of the packet, uh, we salt it, and now the meat starts penetrating the the the, the salt start penetrating the meat. Uh, 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 you know there is that that lag phase where the bacteria is not going to do a lot of things. We're not going to have within the first hour an increase of bacteria from virtually nothing to uh, uh, dangerous levels, but leave that piece of meat outside for a long time and it will be a problem, right? It's the same thing with the refrigerator. We think we can leave, you know, this is the reason why we can't leave meat indefinitely in the refrigerator. You can leave it in the refrigerator and for that first time period, maybe a day or two, it's still fine to use it. But after that, the bacteria overcomes those challenges. They become used to the environment. They relax and they start doing what bacteria do, and they multiply again. And and in a week, there's a problem, and you can't eat the meat anymore. You know. So that's just a little uh, three little afterthoughts to our discussion. That's given us a hell of a lot to think about. Um, given and I, well, not just think about. I think it just explains a whole lot of stuff that uh, that we probably wouldn't have thought about. And thank you very much for that. I think. I think everybody that that sees this uh, podcast will will certainly agree that it's it's been invaluable um, into understanding the actual usage of salt and why we do it and our, our actual understanding of it is the removal of the water that's the preservative and and so so I think that's specifically for beginners. I think that's very important to understand that that's why we actually do it. I mean, sometimes we just go through the motion of doing things. We don't really know why we're doing it, but you know, there, there it is. That's why we are going to remove the water. Um, I, I just wanted to make a point here as well. Well, not on, 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 on the topic, but just basically uh, this is the, the level of discussion that, that we're going to be having in the future. Um, the, the topics that will be coming up will be, um, I think the next one we, we've got on our list is microbiology or microbes, which is very much or closely related to this topic. Um, I don't know if it'll be such a long discussion. Um, it might be, it might not. There's a lot to talk about in microbes because we've got to cover mold and all that sort of stuff as well, yeah. which is which is important. Um, and then we, we will get into the, the hot topic, which is nitrates and nitrites. And I think, you know, I, I, I sort of have a, a box in which I put nitrates and nitrites and I, I work within that box. But just in some of the discussions I've had with Eben, it's almost like Pandora's box. That box has now been opened. And I think we, we, we're going to have multiple podcasts um, just discussing nit nitrites and nitrates. Um, so, so that'll be coming in the future. But just in terms of, of topics, if there's anything specific that, that you guys at home don't understand or would like to understand or, or just have questions about, send it through. We'll take a look at those and see if we can work it into our discussions, um, particularly dealing with the topics that that we de that, that we're talking about. And I, I will be listing that um, on this page as well to see what what we're going to be talking about in the future. So if you've got any questions, send them through. You know, chances are we will probably be debating them, but if we're not, we'll work them into the discussion, and, and at least you can get an answer to those questions. And then lastly, Eben, I just I want to say thank you very much for your time. It, it is a Saturday afternoon and I, I, you did show me a bottle of Merlot somewhere along the line. So I'm sure you're going to pop that cork. 
<laughs> um, here we go. It looks like a very nice one as well. I, I, I miss South African wines, I must say. Um, so, so enjoy and thank you so much for, for the time um, that you've taken to do this. And I know, well, uh, I know how much time it does take to research and to make sure that, that one is up to speed. So thank you very much for that. You know, from my side, if I can just also say, I, I think this initiative, it is absolutely invaluable. And I want to thank you for that. And, and uh, uh, from, from two perspectives, one is the home carer who's doing these things and, and uh, he wants to do a good job. He wants to do a safe job and he wants to create something that is unique and something that he can be feel proud of and, 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 and give that to his family to eat. And it's a very personal thing. Uh, but to make sure that it's done in a safe way, that is very important. And that's part of what we hope to contribute and contribute to the art of, of uh, curing, which in a way was a lost art, but is definitely coming back in these days. Um, and then second to that is the component we want to take hands with the, with the industrial uh, um, operation. You, uh, you know, you have great experience on the, on the, on the curing side, the artisan type of things, the, the, the speciality type of things. And it will be fantastic. I can't wait to learn and to get into those topics. You talk about mold that opens up a whole different uh, kettle of fish in terms of curing the effect of mold, the importance of that uh, on the type of curing that we talk about, that you talk about. And then the industrial side, which is more well, it's the experience that I have, uh, we want to create that forum also where, where production managers and, and formulation specialists, new product development uh, uh, experts can be a part of this. And, and food safety, in a sense, is, is one of those things that if I discover something, that if, if something is discovered, let's, let's just say I will discover it, I, I, will, discover, I will discover nothing. Uh, it, is, it will be discovered somewhere in some food institute or wherever. And there's any, it is a global concern. It is a very personal thing to all of us. And so we want to create a forum also here where where production managers and all these specialists can contribute and, and ask their questions. And uh, uh, we, we, we spoke about the, the meat industry in a sense that do things because of experience teaching them. And then science runs behind and, and, and pick up and explain, OK, this is why, this is why, this is why. But there's production managers out there with experience that is absolutely invaluable and we're going to create this platform where they can contribute and ask their questions. Uh, uh, you know, bacon curing, for example, if you, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, somebody may say, I made, a, uh, I, I made a ham or I made bacon or whatever and I had this experience, this happened, why did that happen? I don't understand it. And then we'll interrogate it here and then we'll also uh, uh, create this as a platform, which is very exciting, to interview some of the legends in the industry. Who's, uh, 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 who brought us concepts that is everyday household names now. Oh, those concepts were invented, not invented, discovered by somebody. Uh, 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 those people are normally very old people <laughs> and living in retirement homes or whatever. Uh, and, and what we hope to do is also to create a platform here where we can, can, can interview them and find out what was, how did you discover that? Right? And by understanding the foundations of this, you know, the first person to ever come up with this concept by talking to him, the, the wealth of information that we can learn and make available to the broader industry around the world. I think it's just absolutely uh, amazing that we can do that. And I want to thank you for creating that platform because that uh, uh, the, the whole purpose behind that Earthworm Express blog that I have is exactly that. It is to tell the untold story of meat science in particular, but food science in general, you know, be, before those people pass on that, uh, you know, let's get it first and from them to equip the current and the future generation of scientists. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think it would be, you know, for me, it's, it, it would be absolutely fantastic to be able to interview and talk to people like that. So I, I'm looking very much forward to that. But, uh, Evan, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. you don't want to miss out on any of our future podcasts, just click on the subscribe button below and hit the notification bell and you'll be notified as soon as any new podcasts have been posted.